It's February and St Valentine's Day is just around the corner. So I thought I'd do a project inspired by that feeling when two young lovers touch hands for the first time and there's a spark of electricity. Maybe music is heard in the air. But I'm not going to rely on romance for that connection. No, I'm going to get my Romeo and Juliet to form a human circuit using the equipment on the board behind me. So here I have an Arduino and that is connected through these wires here to the two metal bars on either side of the board. When my couple hold the two metal bars in each hand and then touch in the middle, that will form a circuit and that's going to get the Arduino to trigger an MP3 module to play, going to an amplifier which is just off camera, and the air will be filled with the sound of angels, or the sound of the Beatles in this case, in fact. Let me show you it in action. I want to hold your hand. Lovely. Now, admittedly, that wasn't much of a human chain. It was more just me holding on to two pieces of metal. So let me recruit the help of some extra subjects to carry on demonstrating this. Alright, oh, okay. And then all you have to do, just note, like, like, how <laughs> Like that. Okay. I don't know, maybe so. I'd say just like that. I want to hold your hand. I want to hold your hand. Okay, so I think you get the idea. Let me now just talk through some of the main components which I'm using in this uh, project. And the first one is this DF Player Mini module there. So these only cost uh, a couple of dollars. You can get them very easily on the internet. And they have a micro SD card which is inserted in there. Onto that you can save um, MP3 files or WAV files of sound effects and sounds that you want to be triggered on the unit itself. So it is possible to actually play back uh, MP3 files directly on an Arduino. I've done that in one of my previous projects, but doing so uses up uh, quite a bit of processor capability on the Arduino. The advantage of using a separate module like this is that you kind of offload all that processing time onto a dedicated module so the Arduino can carry on processing the other parts of the puzzle. So these are really simple to use. Like I say, you plug in a receive and a transmit line from the Arduino uh, just to send a message that says play a particular indexed file or stop playback. And you can read a busy pin to say is a, a file being played at the moment and things like that. So that's the, the main component I'm using. And one of the reasons I chose to use this as the main output for this project, most of my other projects I've used um, relays, which have triggered mag locks and things like that. But I think that kind of audio is an often forgotten part of um, the feedback that you can provide to players of puzzles. We get obsessed with lights and LEDs and sort of flashing visual effects. But I think it's quite nice to, to use audio for a change. So that's why I chose that. So in terms of outputs, there's two different ways you can get the sound out of the DF Player Mini. Uh, it has a mono speaker output, which you can use to directly drive a, a small speaker like this. So this is a, a three watt speaker. And if you wanted a project that was going to make quite sort of quiet, discrete sound effects. So let's say you had a keypad and you wanted there to be kind of different sound effects on the different keys. You could save those as individual MP3 files in the DF player and trigger them on a small speaker like this. But if you wanted to have um, more of kind of a room filling sound, which is what I wanted for this project, then what you can do instead is take the stereo line out from the DF player and put that into an amplifier. So I'm using a, a small amp like this. This is a, a stereo 50 watt amp and it's got an auxiliary input there. So I'm taking the stereo line out from the DF player into the module here. And then I'm using that to power um, just a pair of regular hi-fi speakers like that. And that will create a big enough sound to kind of easily fill a room. Um, the only other thing to mention, so I have seen some reports on the internet of people having problems with uh, powering the DF player module. Some people suggest that you need to have 
a separate power supply from it to isolate it from the Arduino, things like that. I haven't found that to be the case, but it is true that it uh, needs sufficient power to run. So I'm using a, a dedicated switching power adapter for this project. This is a 5 volt 3.8 amp project. Uh, I'm obviously in the UK, so this has a 240 volt AC input, then that's the output. And I'm using this to power both the Arduino and the DF player itself. And I found that using that, um, combined with a couple of capacitors on the supply line to the DF player as well, uh, I've not had any issues with uh, power cutting out or popping and, and things like that. So that's the other recommendation I'd have for this project. Some of my other projects you've been able to power directly using uh, 5 volts from a USB input of the Arduino and powering other devices from the 5 volt out of the Arduino. You're not going to be able to do that for this project because the power requirements of the amplifier are uh, quite a lot. Um, so get a, a dedicated power supply like that. So there's really two different parts to this project and I've tried to separate them out on the breadboard to kind of emphasize that fact. Everything over the left hand side here, this is to do with detecting the human circuit and whether there is a continuous contact made between these two points here. And that's read on the A0 uh, analog pin here. And everything over the right hand side of the breadboard, well that's all to do with the MP3 output which is coming from this DF player mini. So I'll kind of treat them in separation because you might want to use this project but let's say instead of playing an mp3 file you might want to trigger a relay module for example or maybe you want to use an mp3 player but you want to trigger it from something else other than the finger touch. So I'll kind of uh, I'll treat them separately. So let's look at the uh, human circuit element to start with and I'll just zoom in on this side of the board. So what is going on here? Well I'm using the A ref pin here. Now this is something I haven't really used before, but it's uh, this will be equal to the voltage that the analog circuitry on the Arduino is treating as a high logic voltage. So I'm using an Arduino Nano here, so A ref is basically going to be five volts. Okay, so I've got a five volt signal coming out here. I'm going through this resistor here. This is a one mega ohm resistor, so this is a very high value resistor here. And let's just assume for now that there is no connection between these two wires up here. So at the moment I've got 5 volts coming out of A ref across a 1 mega ohm resistance. There is no contact here so instead it's going to go through this 1 kilo ohm resistor and then at this point we're going to read the voltage on A0 and then it's going to go back to ground. So there is only a single circuit connected and 5 volts is going all the way through that. So A0 is going to read 5 volts or high whenever this is unconnected. Now let's suppose that we do have a connection here that is going between one or more people and closing a circuit. Well now if we look through the circuit again when we get to this point here what we've done is we've created a voltage divider because there's actually two routes now through the circuit. There's the one that we had already but we also have this one that comes up this way across the conductive uh, skin surface and back down through this one kilo ohm resistor and back down. So the way a voltage divider works is that the voltage that goes um, between the different parts of the circuit varies in proportion to the amount of resistance encountered. So we've got a one mega ohm resistor here and I've chosen that deliberately to be something like approximately the resistance of a human being, basically. Um, now, if I am correct, and that's the case, that um, this is equal to the resistor here, then we have um, two resistors that are of equal value. So the reading what we've now should find on A0 is half of what it was, because we've got half of the voltage being split down the path it was going through originally and we've got half going across this path. Now let's say that uh, the resistance here is increased so let's say it's uh, two mega ohms here instead. Well what we now have is we've got a third going down the um, 
path here and two thirds going across here. So we'd now expect to get a reading of uh, 3.33 volts, for example. Now, it's not quite as straightforward as the more people you add, the more resistance uh, gets applied here. People have very different resistances in their skin anyway, and it's actually much more to do with things like uh, how sweaty they are, the humidity of the air, and actually the total amount of surface area um, that they use to make the contact here. So if you grab like a really good armful of someone, you'll get a much better contact and the resistance will go down here compared to if you just touch fingertips, for example. But this whole side of the circuit here, oh, and the, the capacitor and the two one kilo ohm resistors, they're just to provide a bit of uh, isolation and uh, sort of smoothing of the signal, essentially, just so we can get a reliable read on the A0 pin that's going to tell us whether this is closed or not. So that's the touch detection part of the circuit. Now let's go over and have a look at this side of the circuit instead, and this is to do with the sound generation. So the main module I'm using here is something called a DF Player Mini. These are marvellous little modules. They only cost a couple of dollars. Uh, and they have an SD card slot here. So you can copy MP3 files or WAV files. Um, they go up to, I think, 48,000 kilohertz, 16-bit uh, frequency. So they're pretty, I mean, it's like CD quality uh, audio that you can save on these cards here. And you can address them from the Arduino through a serial connection. So I've connected two pins from the Arduino to the receive and transmit pins here. Um, depending on which library you're using, you can assign different pins here. Um, but the important thing is that you need to have a one kilo ohm resistor on both of those lines there, uh, just to make sure that you, you get this signal at the right strength by the time it arrives at the DF player. Um, again, we're running at 5 volts here. This really prefers to run at something closer to 3.3 volts. So the resistors here will just uh, reduce that signal a bit. Um, now, I've got two different potential outputs from the DF player. If you want to power a small speaker like this directly, uh, so long as it's under 3 watts in power, you can do so by uh, using pin 8 and pin 6 here and just go straight to the positive and negative of the speaker terminal itself. Alternatively, and what I'm doing in uh, this project here, is I'm creating a line out, a stereo line out, um, which I'm doing by connecting to the uh, digital audio right here and also the left channel here and also the ground here. So I'm going... The ground goes to the uh, sleeve of the uh, three and a half millimeter jack. The left audio goes to the um, uh, ring, and the left audio goes to the tip. And then I plug my three and a half millimeter jack into there, and that goes to my audio. The final point to note about the DF player itself is that a lot of people have uh, expressed power problems with it, and suggest that you might need to power it from a different power adapter from powers the arduino i've not actually noticed that at all the one thing i have noticed is that you do need to use a separate power supply so i've got a 5 volt power supply coming in here and i'm using a 4 amp 5 volt power supply so enough power to power the amplifier and the arduino i've also put a 220 microfarad capacitor just before the df player itself just to smooth out any um, power surges that might happen there. And finally, I've put a diode here across the power input to the deer. So rather than supplying it directly with 5 volts, I've put that across a 1M4001 diode, and that's going to drop the voltage supply slightly to about 4.2 volts. And I found that that increases the quality of the sound quite a lot, and also reduces popping um, that you might otherwise experience on the DF player. Uh, so that's it for the wiring. Here's the code that's running on the Arduino, and actually it's pretty straightforward. It comes in at uh, under 100 lines, even with uh, quite extensive comments. So it's it's pretty straightforward, this one. Um, so to start with, I'm using the software serial library here. So the DF Player Mini communicates with the Arduino through a serial connection. 
And most Arduinos, the Uno and the Nano, for example, only have a single hardware serial connection. Now, if you're using the USB interface to upload code or to run the serial monitor, you're already using that hardware serial interface there. So what we're going to do is we're going to emulate another serial interface to communicate with the MP3 trigger, and that's what this software serial here is for. There's a couple of different libraries you can use to do that. Um, software serial is, is quite old. It's not the best one, to be honest, but it is the one that comes with the Arduino IDE. So that's the reason I'm using it here is because you've probably already got it installed on your system. And actually, we're not looking to send a lot of data via serial. It's basically a pretty simple command just to tell the uh, DF player to start playing a sound file or to stop it again. So for that reason, I've, I've used this one, even though there are uh, perhaps better alternatives available. Um, here's another library using. So this one I got from this GitHub link here. So you can actually handcraft the serial commands yourself to send to the DF player. Um, but rather than having to do that, this is just a library to simplify that. Um, so all it will do is it will make it a little bit more straightforward to send the commands to stop and play the files. So that's where you get that one from. So download that library and install it uh, as a subfolder of your um, project like that, and then include that library as well. Uh, I've got a define here. I always do this, all my code. If you've watched my tutorials before, you'll be familiar with this. So this is just a conditional statement, which while this line is here, um, it's going to be some extra debugging information, which is gonna make it easier to um, test the values that you're getting on the sensor. So if you need to calibrate it slightly based on your environment, um, or if you ever have any problems running the code, um, I always use a, a little statement like this at the top, and that's going to include some conditional code later on. When you're happy that it's working and you no longer need that debugging information, you can just put a comment on that line there to take that out. But I'll include it to start with. Then we get into the constant section. So these are all the things which are not going to change throughout the code. So that's why they're constant. This is the pin that we're using to measure the voltage across the circuit to determine whether the human circuit's been made or not. This value here, so this is going to be the reading uh, that we're going to compare that voltage to to determine whether the circuit's been made or not. So when you take a, a reading from an analog pin on an Arduino, you'll get a value between 0 and 1023. And the way the circuit's been set up in this example here is when the circuit's not been made, so when people aren't holding hands, you should get a, a reading here of close to 1023 because it's directly connected to the AREF pin. When you do have that continuous circuit of people holding hands, it will fall, but the exact amount that it falls will depend on lots of factors. So like I say, it's the amount of skin-to-skin -skin contact, uh, how sweaty people are, how naturally conductive their skin is. So you might want to tweak this value a little bit to, um, to get a value that will reliably set off. And it also depends how many people you want to have in the chain in your puzzle. So you can, you can vary that a little bit, but I found 500 works pretty well for, for me. That was the value I was using in my tests here, and that would work with any number of people between one and five, uh, certainly where I am. Um, we'll create a, a simple little state machine here just to keep track of what the puzzle is doing at the moment. Uh, again, that just makes it easier to write the logic and to check if anything goes wrong. Um, you know, it's happening as it's meant to. Uh, we've just got two globals this time. So this is um, setting up the software interface I was talking about at the top. So that serial interface we're going to use two pins on the Arduino. We're going to have a receive pin and a transmit pin. And uh, each of those is one-way communication. So the receive pin on the Arduino, which is three, goes to the transmit pin on the DF player. And the transmit pin on the Arduino, which is two, goes to the receive pin on the uh, DF player. So each of those is used for just single-way communication, sending and receiving messages. And then we create an object that's going to, uh, we're going to use that to address the DF player itself. Uh, we get into the setup function. So 
like I say, if we're debugging, then we'll make use of... So this is the regular serial connection. This is not the software serial connection. This is the normal hardware one. And this is the one that we're going to use to communicate back to the serial monitor on the PC just to see what's going on. So we'll begin a serial connection at 9600 board, which is a standard uh, speed for communication there. We'll send a little bit of debug information. And then this time we will initialize. So notice this was serial.begin. This is software serial.begin. So this is the secondary emulated software connection which we're going to use to the DF player. Assuming that's okay, we'll print a little bit more information. And then we'll just say what we're doing. We're initializing the DF player. And then this line here, so this uses the software serial connection which we just started up here and it begins communications with the DF player on that software serial connection. If that line there uh, returns a true value, that means that we know that um, uh, communication to be successful, so we'll just print a little bit okay, and otherwise we'll just say, well, we failed for some reason. Um, so that's what that line is, a little sad face. Um, okay, this line here, so uh, we'll set the initial volume uh, so this is anything from 0 to 30. If you're plugging a speaker directly into the um, DF player, you'll probably want that to be a relatively high value um, because I find that you, you won't be able to hear a 3 watt speaker very clearly. But if you put it right at the top, you'll also find you might get some distortion at the top end. Um, if you're using the line out into an amplifier, how as I am doing in this project, uh, you it will depend obviously on the uh, the value that you've got on your amp but I found somewhere in the middle works pretty well so I'm setting it to 16 here. You can later adjust that in code as well so if as part of the puzzle you actually want the volume to go up and down um, you know that doesn't have to be fixed value you can adjust that as many times as you want. I'm just setting it once in setup though for this particular puzzle. And then uh, we'll now say okay so we've completed all our setup we'll move the device state into circuit open which is saying that the uh, hands are not being touched at the moment so the circuit is in an open state. We'll say setup is complete and finally this bit here just to get a clean reading what I find sometimes is um, if you want to get a, a really good reading on the analog pin uh, it's sometimes useful to do a couple of kind of dummy reads from it and then just discard those values so that when we get onto the main loop we'll will start a fresh kind of thing. So that's what this does. And it also introduces just a little bit of a delay here. So it loops through 20 times. On each loop through, we read the sensor pin, but then we don't actually do anything with the result. And then we'll just delay by 50 microseconds before reading again. Okay, and then we go on to the main program loop. Um, so we start off by taking a reading at that sensor pin. Um, so remember that's going to give us a, a value between 0 and 1023. If we're debugging we'll print that value out to the monitor. And then what happens next will depend on what the state of the puzzle is. Now, uh, so if the puzzle is still initialising, well hopefully that won't happen um, because when we ended the setup function back up here we did actually move the device state into the circuit open so that line there should have meant that at the end of setup um, we moved into circuit open but I just put it in as a catcher to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, if the circuit is currently open so that means that if currently people aren't holding hands to connect those two contact points what we'll do is we'll compare the reading value that we got up here and we'll compare that to the threshold value which we defined at the top of the code as uh, 500, so this value here. So that's about half halfway down the potential values that we could get from that reading. And if the reading is less than that value then we're going to say well that is our trigger to say okay the continuous human circuit has been made. So the next bit is what action do we want to take when that happens. Now like I say in this example I'm playing a sound effect partly because that's something which I haven't done before and partly because I think uh, a lot of sort of puzzles like this are quite visually um, focused you know people will make LED displays light up or things flash and things like that and I think that music and audio is sometimes a bit forgotten as a feedback mechanism so I think it's quite a nice idea for this to to have a, a musical output but if you wanted to trigger a relay instead let's say 
um, this is the part of the code where you would insert that in. So you know you could send a, a low signal to an active low relay to trigger a mag lock or something else like that. This is where you would add that in. Uh, but in this case, we're going to play the sound effect. So uh, this is a function from that DF player library, which I included at the top. It's called play mp3 folder. So on the SD card that's inserted into the DF player, I've got a folder in the root directory just called mp3. And then within that, I've got a number of uh, numbered files. So they all begin with a four digit number starting at 0001. And then after that, you can actually write anything you want. So you can have a, a, a descriptive file name as well, but the first bit needs to be a four digit index number. And that is what we're going to pass as a parameter to this play mp3 folder function. So this says play the first numbered file in the mp3 folder. So it's going to be the file that begins with that bit there. And it can either have a, a .wav extension or it can have a .mp3 extension. It will play both fine. Um, I've, I'm using WAV files because I find that they, um, although they're much bigger, so if you have a lot of files, you might prefer to use MP3, but I find that the WAV files trigger slightly faster. Um, I guess because of uh, the way that the encoding works on the MP3, maybe they need to be decoded first, and that takes just a, a fraction of a second. But if you want an instant response, I do find that the, the WAV files work slightly better. Uh, so that's what this does. Play, play the first file in the MP3 folder, uh, and it will trigger that up there. We'll then just put a short delay because um, when people first hold hands, sometimes they kind of touch and then they bounce away again, touch again, and you don't want that sound file to be kind of repeatedly triggering and stopping and triggering again. So we'll just delay just for a tenth of a second before we continue and check the circuit again. That's what that does there. And we'll say that the, um, the state is now closed because we believe that people are now holding hands. Um, the final case we can go, so okay, well let's say that if we're in the loop and the puzzle is currently closed, so people are holding hands, well, we'll check the reading again, and this time we want to see if it's greater than the threshold, because that would suggest that while they were holding hands, they've now stopped doing so, and that reading has gone back to a, a high state. If that happens, we'll simply stop playing any audio that might have been playing before, so that's what that command does. Again, we'll put a short delay before we check it again, and we'll move the device back to the open state. So the device, when the puzzle is running, it will continuously run. It's not something that has a latch solution. It will just keep on running over and over, and it will go between these two states, depending on whether the value of that reading at the voltage divider is less than the threshold, or whether it is more than the threshold, it will move between them. And that's it. So I found this quite a fun project to do because it's given me an opportunity to use some new components which I haven't used before. Uh, and I think I probably will use those DF player modules again in future projects just to be able to add that element of uh, audio feedback to the player, which I think is really important. I hope you found this video uh, useful and informative. Uh, if you have any comments or suggestions, please let me know below. And if you would like to, and if you're able to support me to continue making these videos, uh, or if you want to access the code download or the bill of materials and things I use to create this, um, please do check out my Patreon, which will be linked in the description as well. And thanks very much for watching.